Hi, I'm Father David Dufresne, parochial vicar of St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Church in Arlington, Virginia. Welcome to the St. Charles Podcast. The Lord be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Immediately on seeing him, the whole crowd was utterly amazed. They ran up to him and greeted him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I have brought to you my son possessed by a mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they were unable to do so. Jesus said to them in reply, O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I endure you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, the spirit immediately threw the boy into convulsions. As he fell to the ground, he began to roll around and foam at the mouth. Then he questioned his father, How long has this been happening to him? He replied, Since childhood. It has often thrown him into the fire and into water to kill him. But if he can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can, everything is possible to one who has faith. Then the boy's father cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus, on seeing a crowd rapidly gathering, rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, Mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Shouting and throwing the boy into convulsions, It came out. He became like a corpse, which caused many to say, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. When he entered the house, his disciples asked him in private, Why could we not drive it out? He said to them, This kind can only come out through prayer and fasting. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord, with your permission, I'd like to ask you, how many of you have already failed with your Lenten resolutions? Nobody. Wow. Bunch of liars. So I'd like to focus on failing tonight. Not a very popular topic. Nobody likes to fail. Hopefully, that'd be weird. That's not something that we enjoy but we do it all the time. So what is our relationship with failure? And I am proposing or challenging that we have a good relationship with failure, which is not normal, but it's necessary and helpful, and we need to improve our relationship with failure. We notice in the passage I just proclaimed The disciples failed. They were not able to do what people asked them to do, even though, in a certain sense, they should have been able to. And they recognized that. And that's not a good feeling. It's not a good place to be. A couple little caveats. Liturgically, we're a little bit out of of the linear line. This comes right after the Transfiguration, which we'll hear this coming Sunday, the second Sunday in Lent. So right after the transfiguration, they saw the glimpse of the Lord's glory, Peter, James, and John. And so they they had an idea of the real majesty and power of the Lord. And it says that they were arguing amongst themselves, debating with the Pharisees. I kind of picked up that they were debating on why they're a failure, why they were not able to do it. Because then the father presents his son When Jesus asked the question, what were you arguing about? 
The next thing that happens is the father brings his son. Your disciples were not able to drive this spirit out. And then our Lord seems to be grieved by the apostles in their failure. O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? So there's something about, and I would propose, not the failure of the apostles to drive out the Spirit. I don't think that's why our Lord is grieved. It's not the fact that they couldn't do it. It's perhaps why they couldn't do it that grieved him. Because then he says at the end, it comes out through prayer and fasting. I'll unpack that in a little bit. So they were arguing, they were having a hard time with failure, and often we have a hard time with failure. So the prayer, the fasting, and then the belief. I do believe, Lord, but we all recognize we don't believe the way we should. So they're kind of those three elements. Part of that, too, I think, is being self-sufficient. Right? So our belief, oftentimes we only pray or really have faith or really approach the Lord when we're desperate, like the father bringing his son, right? or when we're in a really low part, and we can like feel our faith come alive. But a lot of times we just kind of are in our own little world. Right? And prayer and fasting is supposed to re- recall to us, we're supposed to remember Uh, that we can do zero things without the Lord. Okay, so that's how I kind of see all those things connected. But my relationship with failure has certainly changed over the years. And I I thought like the most relatable story, at least the times at least that I'm comfortable talking about quite publicly about my failures, uh, involves trying to climb mountains. I thought, you know, there's plenty of other great examples. You know, baseball players, if, if they're batting 300, that's pretty dang good even though they're failing two out of every three pitches that they're missing. But to bat 300, that's good. So there's a lot of other lessons, and so if you don't understand the mountain um, analogies, make up your own analogy. But here's mine. So this summer I plan to go uh, to the Grand Teton in hopes of climbing it. It will be my fourth attempt. So I've failed three prior times. That kind of stings a little bit, and there's a reason why I'm going back. I don't like failure. I want to get to the top, right? There's something kind of bizarre about that. Like, there's nothing up there. I think Gaffigan had the the bit, like, there's not even a restaurant. What are we doing at the top of this mountain? We have to go back now. There's something about that. The the very first mountain that I attempted to climb as an adult uh, is called Blanca, Mount Blanca in south central Colorado. And that was an uh, utter failure. In fact, it took me four times to get to the top that particular mountain. And, and the, the first one uh, was, was just a failure in every measurable metric of failing. Um, I won't bore you with, with all the details, and I'll talk about it a little bit more next week um, for other reasons. But it, it was a disaster. And, and so we kind of parked at about 8,000 feet elevation. The, the total is a little bit over 14,000. So we, we walked in, and I think that original plan was to walk to about 10,000 feet. We probably walked five feet. Like, we, we, we could still see the car. We were so close. We, we, we made it um, next to nothing because we drove straight from sea level or Columbus, Ohio, after a seminary academic class got out. And we were not prepared physically with, with our equipment, with the weather, uh, with our food, um, we, in one sense, set ourselves up for failure. But I look back fondly on that experience, right? I learned quite a bit from that failure. That was the first time I failed climbing. I got altitude sickness as the first, and, and thanks be God, the only time I've ever gotten altitude sickness. I didn't know what was happening. I thought I was dying. I mean, it was like five times worse than the flu. I could barely move. I, I ached so much and I had such a kind of um, severe fever. I was like hallucinating. No idea what was going on. I thought I was dying. Um, and I suppose I am. I'm one day closer today. I've never been closer to dying than I am right now. Same thing with you. But anyway, so, but I'm sitting there in the tent just like, I call this fun? Like, why am I here? You know, and, and my other climbing buddies, um, they're like, well, we're going we're gonna to go make an attempt. And it was May. It was right after academic year. I mean, it's still very much winter when we got up to about 10,000 feet. So well, we were able to set up a camp, but there was snow all around us. 
And as they're trying, and they still had, I don't know, like three or four miles um, to, to hike and then maybe another um, 3,000 feet vertical to, to climb. They got maybe 20 feet from camp and it was just, they were post holing meaning like every step they took, they would sink like three feet into the snow. They didn't have snow gear. They didn't have snow shoes. They're completely ill-equipped. We should have died. But I love that experience. And I think very fondly on that experience after the fact, after we got back, um, just of how much failure was a teacher in that experience. It didn't feel good at the time. It was embarrassing, you know, because the number one question people asked when I got back, did you make it? Not even close. Right? That's not a good feeling, but it was a good, if not great, experience. Failure. And I went back the second time, uh, and I'm like, okay, I'm prepared for the winter. And, and we had like snowshoes on. And, um, and somehow got off the, the trail and like just the point of no return and um, spending way too much time. And so the day was heating up a little bit and the snow was starting to melt. Uh, and we were on this like hill. And so the, we would take a step and kind of slide down the hill. Well, the hill's a very um, um, innocent term. It's more like a cliff, right? Or at least the, the slope and then the cliff, like a 2,000 foot vertical drop. And, and I started to slide with all this snow as is melting. And uh, I was, by God's grace, was able to take a snowshoe from my feet and like plant it into the ground um, to kind of stop me from sliding off to oblivion. And then my friend's like, I think we should go back. Yeah, I agree. Right, total failure by, by a lot of metrics. And uh, I'm glad I'm alive, for sure. But that failure taught me a lot. Right? Not, not, again, having to go back for the second time to admit to all my family and friends, no, I didn't make it, but I'm alive. And isn't that a consolation prize, right? And then I learned something about um, safety. I learned something about um, danger. I learned something about equipment, right? Prudence. Uh, so that experience, I'm very thankful for. And then a third time, we don't, I mean, basically we got snowed in, so there's not a lot of drama there, but we, we, I picked up a friend from the airport as they were shutting down the highways because there was so much snow at the time. And, and he was a friend who was on the first trip. So like, we're doing it this time. You know, we have all the gear, a lot more know-how, a lot more experience under our belt. And, and it just dumped like three feet of snow. So even with the snowshoes, um, we're still sinking so much. And, and, and so we weren't able to get to like 9,000 feet elevation. Uh, it was just too uh, exhausting. Okay. So a lot of failure, a lot of great lessons. And things like that have changed my interaction, my experience, my relationship with failure. So yeah, at the time, it's not fun. It's embarrassing. But it's good. And I'm better in the mountains because of it. You know, so I'm leading a... Um, a parish trip to the Rockies next uh, summer, well, this August, kind of the Rocky retreat. So it'll be daily mass and a lot of great spiritual things and reflections. But I kind of want to pass that on to you. Like if you think I would never be able to do, you know, climb these mountains in the Rockies and well, you can. And, and it's because of kind of this confidence of climbing dozens and dozens of these mountains over the years and the last couple of decades um, that I can kind of pass this on with, with confidence that you would be in good hands. But to kind of do it um, on your own, you'd probably fail like me, right? which is also good. But it's that idea of, of pushing through, putting yourself in that situation um, that's hard, that's challenging. In a sense, like setting yourself up for failure. I was thinking of this in, in relation to like, why are we so afraid at times of failing? What is it about failure that, that makes us so afraid? Ad adverse, scared, of failing. And it could be a number of things, but often it could be debilitating. It could be paralyzing. This fear we have, and maybe it's we don't want to look bad. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want other people to know that we don't know what we're doing, that we're ill-equipped, or um, we're a fraud in a certain sense, that we don't really belong there. Those are all kind of legitimate fears, right? There's, there's legitimate fears to be had in the mountains, right? Sliding off of a cliff is a legitimate fear, no doubt. But, but fear of failure, right, shouldn't be. 
feel, fear of falling off the cliff, that's legitimate, right? So there's different elements of fear that are all kind of intertwined. There's some legitimate, some kind of more irrational. C.S. Lewis talked about, in, in 1948, a, a small little essay, but it's very punchy. He talks about how do we live in an atomic age? Right, right after World War II, you know, who has the nukes? Who's, who's you know, on the button? Like kind of being in this fear, now um, this existential fear that at any second, the entire world can just be destroyed. So he wrote this essay, how do we live with that sort of fear? He says, the way we've always lived. Not a very satisfying answer, but very profoundly true answer, meaning that our great ancestors feared the Vikings coming to shore and destroying everything. There, there's always something in the darkness out there, over there, to fear. As um, Abraham Lincoln said, you know, I, I, can, I can die once and that's it, but if I live in fear, I die a hundred times a day. So we have to distinguish those different types of fear. And I was, I was thinking when we can be paralyzed by fear, we can, we can be overwhelmed with it at times. I, I forget where I heard this, but it's a, a pithy little three-step process to deal with whether discernment or a problem or an issue, to think of um, the issue or problem as a doctor, as the enemy, and then as like the general who's giving orders. Right, to, Doctor, just kind of diagnosing what's going on here. What am I actually afraid of? Let's just like try to look at this situation objectively, kind of remove my feelings for a moment. What am I dealing with here? What's legitimate? What's irrational? Then the enemy, what would the enemy have me do? If the enemy wants me to fail, what, what lies would he be um, whispering into my ear? What would he be trying to get me to do or to not to do? Right? And then the general, in this case, it would be Jesus, right? What, what's the battle plan here? What's the step towards victory? What's the ultimate goal, and how do I get there? So to kind of recognize in the mountain example, you can make your own example, that our, our wisdom comes from these experiences, and often our experiences are foolish, right? Our experiences involve failure. So if we, if we want to be confident, if we want to be wise, we have to do the thing that will often be filled with forms of failure. But that's how we make progress. So that important distinction too, that right, you are not a failure. That is not your identity. I've failed plenty of times, but I am not a failure. That's not my identity. So I think Lent above all, right, even if uh, you've already failed in a certain sense with your Lenten resolutions. Even if you've noticed, you're kind of starting to cut the corner. Today um, is, is the feast, if you will, of St. David of Wales. Boy, was it tempting to use that as an excuse just to throw in the towel just for today because it's my namesake, right? Well, I know myself well enough. Well, if I start to open the door just for St. David of Wales, there's going to be plenty of other doors in the next 33 days that I'll, I'll find an excuse to open up. Okay, so Lent is that time where we get out of our comfort zone to allow ourselves to be more comfortable with failure. And not, not that, now don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying like we give in to, to sin, to, to fail, but we, we do these things kind of in, a, in a, a safe area where we can get more comfortable with failing, where we notice like, what am I tempted to cut corners on? What have I been relaxing in my Lenten discipline? What is that really all about? Okay, so failure can be a great teacher in that sense. To attempt to do something hard, it's through that resistance uh, that we become stronger. And it's through that failure that we become wiser, that we learn a lot more about ourselves, that, that we gain much more by attempting something and failing than we do if, by not trying at all by being too afraid to fail. St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, right, it's when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. It doesn't make any sense unless we've been there. Where we recognize when we get to the point, like the disciples, like, oh, I was trying to do it all by myself. I was just trying to white knuckle it. I was just trying to try harder all on my own without praying, without fasting, without realizing I need God's help. So in that sense, 
the disciples failed because they're trying to be self-reliant. So just another reminder that we are called to be practicing Catholics, not perfected Catholics. Right? Practicing for a reason. So some questions to leave us for this week. Right? Are we defined by what we do or by who we are? Right? Where does our identity really come from? Rhetorical question. We know the answer, but so often we can be like, oh, I am fill in the blank, a failure. No, you might have failed. I might have failed. That's not who we are. So we have to be reminded of who we are, which is ultimately found in our baptismal identity, and even more profound than that, whose we are. Who do we belong to? Not the enemy, not the evil one, not our failures. So sure, we fail, but that is not who we are. It does not define us because failure is not a destination, right? It is a process. A process that results in experience, wisdom, and confidence. It's the last little image before we return to prayer of, of a toddler right, trying to walk. That's kind of us spiritually, most of us anyway. Some of you might be more advanced. A toddler trying to walk, right? A good parent, there's a, a, a natural fear there that they're going to get hurt. They're going to fall. They're going to bump their head. Right? Probably going to happen. They should be attentive, right? They should just kind of like leave, leave the kid to fend for themselves. They, they should do like some normal safety things. But they shouldn't be so concerned for the child's safety that they stunt him from walking. They prevent him from taking the risk. They prevent the child from falling. In one sense, we can say, oh, he failed to walk. But that would be a rather silly way to think about it. No, falling is part of the process of learning to walk. Okay, same thing with us spiritually. Our Heavenly Father is there with us. He takes reasonable precautions. He doesn't delight in the fact that we fall. He doesn't set us up for failure. But he knows that it's part of the process. If we want to be strong enough to walk, we will fall. But we get up again. We know our Father's there. We take great strength in knowing that he's there to help us, to help us up again, to stand and walk and try it all over again. We're wobbly and we fall. It's part of the process. So we have 33 days left of Lent. Let us finish strong. Let us finish with a renewed appreciation of what failure can teach us. To not be overwhelmed in self-loathing, to I identify as a failure to not throw in the towel, but to, to get up again and again and again. So may we embrace these lessons of being uncomfortable and by failing, and may it instill in us a Lenten discipline that will carry over into the rest of our life. May we ask for the grace to continue to fall up. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Thanks for joining us today. And please remember to subscribe. And if you enjoyed our show, give us a rating on the Apple Podcasts. Peace.